And we are live! Welcome to BC Thoughts Live Podcast, the number one source for video game-related discussion on the internet, confirmed by science, recorded live on twitch.tv slash briarrabbit every Sunday evening and broadcast throughout the world via YouTube, iTunes, Podbean, and the Google Play Store? I don't know about that Maybe. one, actually. All Today thanks we- to science, though. Today we'll be talking Destiny 2 news, a conversation about VR, and of course, most importantly, welcome, welcoming back one of the family, the Beastly Gamer, from an extended visit to Mex- Mexico for the Woo! World Cup of Tetherball. Beastly, I'm so happy to see you, man. How you doing, brother? Doing good, man. It's been a long time. Thank you all to everybody who knew what was going on with me and my family uh, for all the well wishes. My wife's doing a lot better. She's at home. I've been really missing the show, missing being here with this witty banter. I've been catching you guys doing great, great work, keeping me excited and entertained. Feels really good. I haven't felt this giddy about being on on Beastly Thoughts in a long time. <laughs> I've been really, really excited about coming back, and I'm looking forward to having a great show. And again, thank you to everybody who's been sending me well wishes. My wife had kidney stones. She had infection in her kidney. They kept her at the hospital for a few days, and... It really turned the world upside down. My kids had no idea there was so much frozen food, boxed food in the world because dad wasn't cooking. It's all there ready for you. Too. Yes. They said, what is a hot pocket, daddy? I said, well, you're we going to find out mom. about that today. Yeah, Bring so, mom home. Yeah. We're so you know, hungry. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want these frozen TVs you know, anymore. The, the, the one who uh, suffered the most, right? The one who suffered the most was the new baby, Ellie, because mm-hmm. she's been breastfed her entire life. So when Kate goes to the hospital, they're giving her all kind of antibiotics. Hey, she's seventy and, years old. Isn't it time to start weaning her off? Huh? <laughs> Five months. <laughs> Hold on. What? Five months old. Did I say seven? I mean, I said no, I I seven old. years old. <laughs> okay. I feel, I have, kind, I have, of, go ahead, I feel kind of bad for the kid as well when you got your sort of big black hairy man nipple out. It was just like, you know, daddy's home. That's it. Just go for it. Oh no. Just don't Gary. look at me, baby. It'll be okay. It's chocolate milk. Yeah, just look away. <laughs> just don't don't make eye contact. It's fine. It's not weird. It was really horrible, right? Because my daughter, she never had anything other than her mother's natural formula, breast milk. And so Kate couldn't feed the baby. They had all kinds of drugs being pumped through her body. The doctors were saying, you cannot feed her. This stuff will affect the baby. So I had to go out and, and find formula and buy the right kind because she wasn't, she did not mess with Similac. She hated it. For the first 12 or 13 hours, she didn't eat anything. She just spit everything out. And so I had to go old school and get the carnation milk. And mix that with some vitamin D and uh, and some K-Rail syrup, and she she downed it, and it was a good night for three nights in a row. Great to be back, guys. Nice, nice. I was I'll wondering where that story you. was going. I thought you were out looking for pregnant women to come home, but you know, I'm, I'm glad you went with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the alternative. Kate's gone for two stuff, days, yeah. and all of a sudden, Beastly's out there like on Match.com. <laughs> <laughs> for someone to take care of this baby, hitting the, hitting the filter must, must be lactating. Must be able to lactate. Yeah, yeah. 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 throw in the diaper alley at the local grocery store. <laughs> that's, that's right. I got a hundred baby here, man. <laughs> desperate times call for desperate measures, as they say. Uh, right? How quick can you get banned from Twitch with a podcast? It's, I don't know. <laughs> we're about to find out. I feel like we're about to. Yeah, we're going to set that record pretty quick here. Pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> Yo, we got an awesome show today. We got a ton of gaming news. Some of the stuff I, I know I'm very excited about. We got a really cool discussion. Um, and for the first time ever, we're doing Twitter questions today, which I think is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it gives uh, chat an insight into uh, uh, whatever they want to know, basically. So should we start it off with the news? Shh. Are we starting with the news or are we going to start with what we've been playing? Oh, yeah. I forgot about what you've yeah. been playing. What we've been playing. What have you been Whatever. playing? New Beastly? format. <laughs> we got a new format, and Briar forgot about the old one. Well, I'll do it real quick. I've been playing two games in a little bit of time, limited time I've had. I bought Tekken 7 the day it came out. That was about two weeks ago. I've been playing that intermittently. I'm really good at it. But it becomes boring when you're not playing with people you know. And I recently bought Friday the 13th on PS4. And that game is a hell of a lot of fun. And uh, apparently we're going to be playing that this coming Tuesday, right, Basically, guys? Are you playing Friday the 13th with friends, or are you playing it solo and queuing up solo? I've been playing it solo. My wife started playing it yesterday. She finally felt good enough to sit in here with me and play it side by yeah. side. And we had a blast doing that. We actually played about four matches again today. Mm-hmm. Uh, the matches last about 20 minutes. There's tons of stuff for you to do and try to figure out how to get escape J- Jason. And we watched some YouTube videos on some of the tactics. It's, it's much more fun playing with people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I played my first experience was playing with DCP. 
and I really had a great time, but at the end of it, I was like, I don't know that I'm going to come back to this game unless I'm playing with friends, right? It, it, but you like yeah. playing it solo, like queuing up solo is not a big deal? It all depends on the group that you get into. One thing I've noticed in this game, probably more so than any other PlayStation game I've played recently, is that a lot of people actually use their microphones. People are on there talking. So when you join a party, there's like four or five people with mics and they're all talking because you got to be able to communicate. You need to know who's found what, what the plan is. Are we going to try to kill Jason? Are we going to try to get out of here with a car, with a boat? So this game is kind of promoting that communication in ways that other multiplayer games don't. Oh, so even oh, the people talking is a benefit. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, I, I know it can be confusing. Yes. Uh, but but it, it can work against you because if Jason is within proximity, he can hear you as well. So the yeah. way that they, they implement it in this game is very meaningful to me. But like if you, you've never played with a group of people and you see someone running towards you, they can tell you what's going on behind them, what they found. And they can ask you what you found and you can you can formulate a plan. So there were many uh, times I, playing that game where I'd just go running down a path. I'd see somebody running up like past me. I'd say, that's the wrong way. That's the wrong way. That's the wrong way. That's the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of people sell each other out on that game. Mm -hmm. You know, like That's Jason will come towards them and they'll be like, there's six motherfuckers by the boat, just leave me alone, go and get them. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he'll just run off and, and attack the other guys. So, yeah, I, I, I can see how it's, you know, it has that, that talking element to it. One comment that I've, I've seen uh, over and over again with it, though, is that it isn't very balanced uh, with Jason and the counsellors, which kind of makes it not very fun. Like, mm -hmm. Jason's a bit overpowered. If you've got a strong Jason, he can just teleport, mm -hmm. grab, and wipe a team pretty yeah. quickly mm -hmm. I, I found that as well uh there are certain things you can do to prolong your death but ultimately unless you've gotten exactly what you need to get out and escape that's pretty much all you're doing you're you're, you're stretching out the inevitable because no counselor alone can kill jason so jason is on to you all you can do is hide or hit him in the head with a stick which basically stuns him temporarily for about five or six seconds while you run a little bit further, you're constantly losing stamina. So the further you run, your stamina bar is running out. And once it's depleted, you basically slow down to a trot. And Jason can then run up on you himself without using any powers. He doesn't run out of stamina and he can kill you right there. So it is a little unbalanced. I found that when you have people with you, it's much easier to uh, take on Jason because more people will have melee weapons or firecrackers to throw at the ground to kind of discombobulate him. But if you're by yourself, it's pretty much a wrap. But that doesn't change the fact to me that it's still a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, I was playing, I was actually Jason, and there was some guy who was talking so much shit to me. I walked into the house, he said, what's up, bitch? I was like, this little motherfucker wow. right here. You got that, he, dude. he ran up to me and hit me in the head with a stick. I fell down. He said, don't chase me no more. You're going to get fucked up. I was like, where was this guy at in the Jason movies? <laughs> I chased this guy, and I swear, yeah. it, he was the last person to die. He had firecrackers. He had a pocket knife. He stabbed me in the neck like three times. So if you do it the right way, if you go out and you loot and you find the right objects, you can really prolong your life and kind of make Jason look like a bitch. Because I hate to say it, this little guy made me look like a bitch. And I was Jason. And, and my wife was like, oh, my God, this guy is owning you. So it all depends on what a person finds, how they utilize it, and how well they can play the game. But, I mean, for me, it's been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I've, since I've been playing that, I haven't gone back to Tekken really at all. I played maybe three or four matches. A lot of my friends don't have Tekken because they're scared to play me, unfortunately. Oh, but that's what it is? Absolutely okay. it is. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Robbie, what have you been up to? Tekken now. With that said, you're on. Say, oh, I, Robbie, what you been no, up to? There's no, one, there's no one in the comment section who can beat me in Tekken. I'll put that out there. <laughs> it's, it's on, basically. It's on. Oh, uh, I anyways, wait. I have been playing some games this week, and I just want to say first... I'm, like, still addicted to PC gaming. Like, I can't stop. It's just my new favorite thing. It really is. Beastly, I'm sorry, but there's something so great about PC. Like, I just want to get a better computer. I want to make something even better, buy a better PC. I'm just obsessed with this. So this week, with E3 happening and with all these amazing game reveals, I've been replaying some of my favorite games, really, on Steam, on PC. One of them has been The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, because I love that game to death, and... I really hope there would be maybe a remaster of it or re-release, which unfortunately hasn't happened. But yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, 10, 11 year old game, uh, but I absolutely love it. I've beaten that game two or three times now, and I just awesome. love playing through it every couple years. It's so much fun. The other game I've been playing is Dying Light because that was a really fun game when it came out. Even though I am kind of sick of zombie games, and I think we've talked about that a fair bit, how many of those type of games there are. 
Haven't played it as much just because, yeah, I was feeling kind of burnt out on it, and I have it feels like something I've played just so many times. But yeah, I've been having a blast, and I've been doing a lot of shopping around on for new PCs as well. Like I'm really, really just thinking about buying a new computer altogether and getting something that's pretty top of the line. That's been my week. Nice. Elder Scrolls nice. Oblivion was the first Elder Scrolls game I played. I actually owned it, uh, Elder Scrolls Three Morrowind, on mm-hmm. the Xbox. And I, I bought the game because everybody was talking about it, but at the time, my mind wasn't ready for a Western RPG, so when I put it in and I, I looked at it, I was like, this is not Final Fantasy. What is this? I don't want to play it. It seemed very convoluted for the time, so I never played it. And right. then when I got when I got it years later, the Oblivion game, that was the first one I actually went and bought the thick Prima strategy guide. It was mm-hmm. like a Bible. I started yeah. reading it, and I was like, you can really do all this stuff in this game? I fell in love with it, and that's probably the, the most fun I've ever had in an Elder Scrolls game. Oblivion was amazing. You're right, Remy. Yeah, phenomenal game. Totally agree with you. Gary, what have you been playing? So, I've been, again, a, a subject of the PC Master Race, much like Robbie. Sucked in. Oh, yeah. and We're getting sucked in, dude. Yeah, it's PC's over. got its claws in. That's all I can say. Uh, it's not letting <laughs> go. So and so amused. <laughs> Yeah, it's been, um, for me, it's been Wolfenstein, the New Order and Old Blood. And the reason I've picked them back up, these are actually games that I kind of played. Um, I spent around two hours in the campaign way back when, when it first released. But the new Colossus coming out re- sort of rekindled my interest in the game and, and got me into it. And currently, uh, New Order and Old Blood are in the Steam sale for $10. So if anyone is interested in picking them up, it's a, a great time to do it. For anyone that hasn't, a uh, game begins closing months of World War II in an alternate timeline where techno-Nazis won the war. So it's it's very liberal with the facts. It's a World War II setting, but just far enough out of our timeline that they can really run with it. Uh, what I thought was really noteworthy was I saw Frau Engel in the trailer for the new Colossus. So she's going to be the primary antagonist, and she's one oh, of the villains man. from the first game. She was such a bitch in the first game. Dude. Yeah, so it was great to play it as a prequel of sorts and something almost as like a heralding game for for the new one that's coming out. What I thought was a bit of a disappointment and something that I think was a missed opportunity was that I my first experience with Wolfenstein was Return to Castle Wolfenstein, which was the online Quake-based or Quake engine shooter, yeah. um, which was almost like very similar to what they're doing with COD World War II, where you had like divisions, so you were like a medic, a uh, sniper, a uh, assault gunner, etc., And that to me was really good fun and quite competitive. And I really wish that they'd taken that squad based shooter element and put it with the Wolfenstein engine uh, and had she had a a multiplayer component. I'm I'm a bit kind of sad to see that we're not going to get that as well with the new Colossus. uh, And it's just a single player campaign as as great as the story was. uh, I felt like it really lacked that Um, closing elements or closing thoughts, I'd say for me, is that it's very similar to 2016's Doom. So if you've played that and enjoyed it, that sort of fast paced very quick arcadey twitch shooter uh, but missed wolfenstein it'd be a great time to pick it up um although there's there's a couple of warnings on the the pc side um yes. Robbie, i know that you've had a lot of problems with an amd gpu do you want to expand on that a little bit just for anyone that's yeah maybe in the same boat so gary even before e3 a couple of weeks before it actually the new order was even cheaper i got it for eight dollars on steam which i was over the moon for because i love the game and you know i was looking forward to playing it it's literally unplayable on AMD cards. There is something about AMD technology they have not optimized this game for. Like, I'm telling you guys that my PC could run this game on ultra settings, you know, 60 frames, fine. I can't lo- run it on the lowest settings and get 30 frames per second. It's that bad. Wow. It is unplayable. It's just, it sucks because it's a game I absolutely love and it's completely unplayable if you have an AMD card. So, Warning to everybody who's thinking about picking it up. It is an amazing game. I love it. Make sure you have an NVIDIA video card because you yeah. won't be able to play it. It's well terrible. If it's any consolation, uh, 1080 Ti plays it okay. So there you go. If you've got a 1080 Ti, you're yeah. probably good. NVIDIA video card, you'll be good to go. But unfortunately, AMD, hopefully they'll patch it or okay. fix it or something because it's just it doesn't work, which is a yeah. bummer. So that's wow. everything for me. Um, I mean, more more that I have been playing, but that's the only thing that I really wanted to share because it's it's something that uh, has grabbed hold of me, and I don't often play single player games um, at length. Such a uh, good one, though. Yeah, uh, I've been playing uh, obviously a lot of player unknowns battlegrounds. Uh, again, uh, I'm really <laughs> enjoying that game, and I'm really excited about the announcements they've made about 
uh, bringing the maps to it. And I'm really looking forward to that. And now that we know yeah. it's coming to the Xbox by the end of the year, I, I feel like it's even adding more interest to the game because now it's not this nebulous, is this coming to uh, consoles Console. thing. It, we know it's coming to consoles. We know it's coming by the end of the year. Uh, so it's just adding to the popularity of the game. The game, it's so dynamic. It's so much fun. We had a game, Gary, a couple of days ago where we had kind of just, I don't want to say given up, <laughs> uh, that's uh -huh. slander really i was playing to the utmost of my ability I'll let you know. <laughs> but we gary also just decided to become a parking lot attendant and just gather every car he could find and park it in the gas station <laughs> and i don't know it's just like there's so yeah. much silly stuff you could do with the game i've really been having a blast with that i you know, every chance I get to play a game, you know, I'll jump on. I was waiting for my wife to get dressed for date night. I just jumped on for a game and, you know, quickly got yep. off. You know, it's like it's one of those games for me where it's just like I'm so addicted to it. Um, and while I'm waiting for Destiny 2 to come out, it's really provided a great distraction. Let me ask you a question because we didn't yeah. get a chance to talk about this because I wasn't here. When you guys saw the Xbox One X version of this game, I guess the slice that they shown... How did that look compared to the PC Ultra settings? I think it looks fantastic. Guys. I don't think the game looks, looks that great, to be honest with you. It PC. doesn't. It's not that. It's not like a. It's not a graphical wower. Um, so, and I don't think they've optimized it very well on PC yet either. So, yeah, um, it's, it's it looks fine so, the, to me. The trailer it's, that they showed looks nothing like the game. In my opinion, really? at least. I mean, it may be the way it was edited. It may be that it was an optimized code or that a game that was running, you know, above settings on a private environment. But I've I've played the game at 4K Ultra. Um, it doesn't look as good as that. I've gone back and watched that trailer a few really? times. Also, the Xbox One X version um, is kind of confirmed to be running at 30 frames per second. So that, to me, is an immediate yeah. turn-off for the console version, but, but just for, for me personally. So it may well be visually attractive, but there's going to have to be concessions, and one of them is going to be frame rate. Oh, wow. That's confirmed, you say? Um, well, when Brendan Green's confirmed. been speaking about it, he's said that the game is up and running on the Xbox One X at a 30-frame lock. So unless that's just in testing and they intend to up the frame rate, that maybe gives me an indication that that's what the final piece is going to look like. It it mm. is possible that they will get it up because he said it was a very early build. Like he'd gotten it up and running in like a few days at thirty frames per second lock. True. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, go ahead, Robbie. Okay, I was gonna say I feel like for Xbox One X in general, I don't understand why they don't do this. Have a 1080p sixty frames per second option for every single game. I think that would be a huge selling point for that console. I really think for PUBG for. Any game. I think 1080p60 should be an option. I think that would be a huge selling point, but yeah. After watching that conference, I'm starting to feel like the Xbox One X is really close to what the PS4 Pro can do. In my mind, before seeing it, I was thinking it was going to just be just blow the PlayStation away, but it seems like they're very close in comparison to me as far as what they're capable of doing, especially, mm -hmm. sorry, Gary, after listening to Digital Foundry talk yeah. about the I really want to see frame rate thing. bumps too, but it doesn't even seem like we're getting that. It's just a visual upgrade, which I just really want that 60 frames option for every game. That would when be I awesome. saw Forza on the Xbox One X, I, I didn't get the impression the PS4 Pro could do that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it could do that. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know. Anthem was ridiculous, so... Oh, I think I think PS4 Pro could do Anthem, but you know, Ford says it's kind of a special case because there's not a lot going on in the background. If you render in the cars at high high definition, you know, the 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 most detailed, you know, polygons you can put together and a nice steady 60 frames per second, 4K isn't that hard for a racing simulator. It's, it's yeah. never been hard. Like look at Forza Three. You know, games that, that have been on the Xbox One still have reached the, the the top, the peak as far as 1080p and 60 frames for the last couple of years because of the genre. It's so easy to do. Yeah. You know, I've it, genuinely it missed having a uh, having a pony on the show. But talking about things that were in, <laughs> um, <laughs> in Microsoft, <laughs> like, talking about things that were shown at, uh, at E3, but maybe not on the main stage or discussed, Destiny 2 had a whole heap of E3 news that wasn't yeah. on main stage. Mm, so should we transition news. into news for the week and yeah. kick off with Destiny 2 post E3 news? So I'm going to run down all the features that have come to light or discussion points that have come to light. Um, maybe if we do one at a time and talk about them, because if not, it's going to be a bit of a blob. What do we think? Let's let's kick off and Absolutely. see how we go. Yeah. So 
Destiny 2 is now confirmed to be 30 frames per second across all consoles, even the Xbox One X with 4K still to be confirmed. Briar, what do we think, the rest of us, what do we think? Does that impact mm. our perception of the value proposition of the Xbox, or is it just a side effect of Destiny? They, they kind of tossed the excuse that the thing had just been announced, but if you, I mean, logically, you would think that they've known about this for, you know, as long as we have. They've been able to target, you know... The, the the hardware that's going to be in this thing my guess is you know for whatever reason maybe they don't have a dev kit so they can't actually confirm that it's going to run at 4k but they it'll have run to have a dev kit by now out. i would think um, they did they they are they are targeting the launch of destiny and the xbox one x is not going to be out for the launch of destiny they got two months after that for the for destiny 2 to or for the xbox one x to come out it's, frankly i don't think it's a story i think it'll be on at 4k if it's not at 4K when the Xbox One X, come, the One X, God, fuck, that's a terrible name. It's like <laughs> it's a tongue twister every it? time that's you want to say it. all the evidence you need. That's all the evidence Microsoft needs. It's a needs. mouthful. Just watch yeah. Briar say it again. What's it called, Briar? Xbox One X. It's terrible. There you go. <laughs> Xbox Unicorn Edition. Yeah. <laughs> Just call it the X. I think would be easy to, so we don't have to pronounce it. So talking about things that are definitely going to hit 4K, did you see the 60 frames per second PC footage that has been released this week? Yes. Who showed Later, that? Who showed that, Gary? Where did you see that at? Uh, I saw YouTube. it on the GeForce. Uh, saw... GeForce linked it first. I think yeah. the one awesome. one and a half minute clip. Yeah, I saw it on Digital Foundry. It looked awesome. The I played that version and it looks phenomenal. Every time you hear a a player who's been playing Destiny and just say PC, PC, it's so good on PC. Trust me, yeah. guys, it looks stupendous. Like running uh, at sixty frames yeah. per second at four K, I was it was it was mind blowing. It was one of the first times I've really seen that uh, in a shooter because not too many games can really achieve that on a on my computer, and I got a high end computer. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully it plays just as well too. Is the important part too? It does. If it can, it does. It. It's, Awesome. It's frustrating that we've only seen a segment of Homecoming, which I know that they've put on the campaign story uh, to show all the, you know, the Apple effects and the particle effects, and they they really want to br bring that out. But I want to see PC 4K multiplayer. Like to me, that's yes, what I'm Crucible really would be in. awesome to see that. Because generally speaking, multiplayer is where the uh, alpha effects and the visuals are scaled back a little. So I'd like to see what the the true representation of the game is going to be on a you know on a standard play. Um, for, for me to really make a decision on it. But from what I've seen, it it does look great. The other um, couple of new segments that I'd like to, to discuss and then pause on are that no ranked PvP is planned, uh, but a possible alternative ha has been speculated as coming down the line or positions as coming down the line uh, to indicate your PvP prowess to other people. And there is 100% uh, confirmed that no rumble will be in the game. So there'll be no free-for-all mode in the game. So these are two crucible changes that are quite dis divisive in the community and have sparked a lot of content creators to put out, um, I guess, I wouldn't say ramp videos, but videos where they're expressed significant disappointment in the decisions Bungie have made. Uh, Briar, as a prominent community member, what's your take on these two things? Rumble's like one of my favorite things to play, especially when I'm just kind of goofing around alone. I'm really sad to see it go. I love Rumble. It's just, you know, you get in there. It's a free-for-all. You don't have to worry about teammates. You don't have to be talking with your team. You can, you know, you just be goofing around and having a good time, trying out some weapons. You know, it's, a lot of people think it's super sweaty in there. I think it's the most casual of things in the world because I just go in there and, you know, shoot people in the head and have a good time. And not to see that coming to Destiny 2, I'm disappointed. Did, I'm did disappointed Bungie... as well. Did Bungie give a reason as to why they removed Rumble? Or I mean, not really. I mean, the new Destiny Two multiplayer experience or the new Crucible experience is really centered around four v four. So they've removed six v six. They're six. They've removed three v three. And you know, if you look at it, four v four, you can very easily have a Rumble match that's you know one versus seven, right? It's an eight person mm -hmm. Rumble match. It's the same amount of players. You know, yeah, yeah. you got to add in spawns on these maps, but I'm bummed about it. Like, I don't really. Yeah. It. And it just, it seems like it's just a loss for, with no, with no kind no of reason. Yeah. yeah. So my suspicion on that one is around playlist congregation. So Destiny made the mistake in Destiny 1 of creating, uh, I think at its peak, 13 playable PvP playlists. So your population is spread so thinly that matchmaking was 
pulling players from like you know Japan, uh, California, Alaska, South Africa into a game just because there was hardly anyone playing within a certain skill bracket that could could you know provide you with a game at that particular time you were queuing by creating quick playing competitive so two queues for destiny you've immediately created you know you're it's a 50 50 chance that the people that are queuing for pvp are going to be in your matchmaking queue at that given time um, and i think having rumble where would it fit it would have been its own playlist so you know, i think they had to make a judgment call do they want to collapse the playlist or do they want to keep one playlist exclusively for rumble and suffer the matchmaking consequences i think a bigger problem is probably no ranked pvp and that's where the big kerfuffle is coming from do we think that a alternative that, that they've suggested i think that the exact wording from luke smith was a way to demonstrate your prowess to other players is really a substitute to a true ranked pvp system it's not a substitute gary mm. and in fact i think it it's more concerning than just not having the rank play that they equate just having some kind of emblem or badge to to show that you're a good PV player, PvP player is such a fundamental dis misunderstanding of what players actually want in a rank playlist, right? Is that's mm -hmm. really it's almost more concerning than the fact that we're not getting the rank playlist is that they don't even seem to fucking understand why we want it. You know, and this yeah. is one of the most requested features of the destiny community over the last three years so it's really concerning to me mm -hmm. it, it's funny as as much as they've seemed to add it to pve they really seem to have taken a lot away in pvp and that's why not what you expect from a sequel right you expect it yeah. to be bigger more, more bombastic yeah. more features more more stuff fleshed to do. out as and well. the fact that in pvp it just seems like it's it's really been reined back in a lot of ways. Very it's, scaled down. It definitely feels like to me too. Yeah. It's, um, I guess that there's been... I the, definitely the, agree. The concerns that the community have, have raised seem to be that a lot of the changes to PvE, I guess before we knew what was happening to PvP, seemed to be PvP-centric. So things like removing special ammo um, and creating this primary and kinetic to try to create balance in PvP. Uh, at the cost, maybe, or I say the cost, or to the detriment of, of the PvE experience, where you haven't got that bombastic special weapon all the time. I think the biggest concern that people have now is that they've diluted PvE at the expense of PvP balance, but then PvP seems to be scaled back for an undeterminate reason at present. I don't know. I think that's a false argument, mostly made by people who haven't played the game. To be honest with you. It, when you when you get into the game and you start playing with the weapons... And like most of the most of those arguments are coming from the fact that you know special weapons are gone and have been moved over to the power weapon slot. Once you actually get into the game, it makes more sense this way. It just it it, it feels good. You know, you, I feel like I have more more options in my loadout for PVE. I I feel like once the beta comes, yeah. my guess is a lot of this argument will disappear a little bit. So. Continuing on the, the bad news bus, I guess, Bungie have had a really bad week for PR. Um, in another interview uh, that Luke Smith gave, talking about Destiny 1 to Jason Shreer, I believe, at Kotaku. Um, and, mm -hmm. Brian, you can elaborate a bit on the positioning of this interview and why, I guess, the some of his comments may be taken um, out of context a little bit. Luke Smith confirmed that if you didn't play Destiny 1, you haven't really missed anything coming to Destiny 2 story-wise, and a lot of characters believed to be important in Destiny 1 may not make a return or even be referred to again in the sequel. So that's the Exo Stranger and Mara Sov, who were believed to be key characters in the lore. Moving forward even more, uh, Bungie, or Luke Smith confirmed that Bungie didn't even know who the Darkness was in Destiny 1, and as such, there will be no reference whatsoever to the Darkness in Destiny what? 2. That's so Instead, weird. Choosing to focus on the light. Yeah. That's insane. That's crazy. Wow. <laughs> this, this is a real bag. <laughs> what have we done stuff. this for? Like, Bizarre. The quote where Luke Smith says, You haven't really missed anything coming into Destiny 2 story wise. He's not saying that you haven't, like, he's not really saying that you haven't missed anything. He's really talking about new players coming into Destiny 2 will be caught up Im immediately and will not feel like they've missed something. Like They won't right. feel like there's this whole saga of Destiny that, you know, they, they've never been a part of. They're going to be brought up to speed. I think, yeah. I, I don't think the choice of words is great here because it really does, 
especially combined with the fact that like the Exo Stranger is gone, Marisov is gone, the darkness is gone. Like they they seem to be rewriting Destiny in a big way, and the the lore of Destiny is going to be changing in a big way. So that does combine with this quote of "You haven't really missed anything." <laughs> you know, is yeah, it, it's a it doesn't really hard. tell a story that I think Bungie wants to be saying. But let's be honest; these are live interviews. You know the the words that he chose. I don't think were were perfect. In this case, though, I don't. This isn't what he's talking about. He's talking about bringing new players on board, getting them up and running with the story. Yeah, the Marisol, the Exo Stranger, and Darkness all disappearing. That shit is uncanny That's to me. That's like you know, I, I made a comparison earlier this week. It's like watching Lost. You see this like awesome thing in this now 15 year old tv show that's probably pretty dated <laughs> black yeah. smoke coming through yeah yeah it's like and the, you never explain it never explaining the exo stranger and saying that that storyline wrapped up nicely <laughs> no i'm sorry it's no, one of it the things that's been didn't. most talked about on the bungee forums over the last three years is like you know there's a meme about it like we don't have time to explain that just I mean, it's one of the defining things about Destiny was that we never finished the story. We never have have any idea about what the Exo Stranger's job is, where she's coming from, who is she. It's so fucking bizarre that they would drop it and then drop it by saying that you got a cool gun from her. We feel like that story is over. The Darkness is our primary antagonist. It's it's not an antagonist because it never actually... It's a force. Yeah, it's something, right? (laughs) <laughs> and the fa- to find out to find out <laughs> that it's not some overreaching mystery that we're going to find out about in Destiny 3 or 4, right? It's it, essentially nobody knows what it is including Bungie is disappointing, right? It's fucking yeah. weird because it was such a big part of the first game. It's like it was cool to game. wonder what this whole thing was. And, and like it's, it's all over there. the Grimmar. If you go to like a lore guy, a guy who makes lore videos about Destiny and there's a bunch of those guys and they they can tell you about the darkness because it's all over the grimoire, right? Mm-hmm. And to just like yeah. excise it, it feels so weird. It feels so weird to me, uh, and it's disappointing. It's really disappointing. Well, the the, the, the <laughs> yeah. sad part about that is going into Destiny Two, you might go and, and start to experience the game and enjoy an aspect of the story, but I fear that it'll disappear in the next game. You feel so, like you might be going through this. All right, thing, so we talked the future, about all this stuff that's disappearing, Beachley. But in all fairness, we also got to talk about what they're trying to achieve right is we know about the we know about destiny's kind of you know fabled poor you know release right is it yeah it was just in commotion the team got shook up like a year before release if not less than that there's yep. all sorts of problems the story was basically thrown out rewritten. they had to use out. the assets that they had and bring them back into the game because they just didn't have time or resources to, you know, do a bunch of new cutscenes. So that's why that story feels so disjointed because it is. Yeah. So knowing that, now that Luke Smith is in charge, the whole management team of Destiny is completely different than it was when De- Destiny One came out. Right? Everybody's right, yeah. new. They've restructured that company. They now have. From what Luke Smith says, a clear focus and clear teams that are now in charge of the Destiny story moving forward. So what they want to do is have like this overarching story that goes, it starts now and goes till the end of Destiny, where you don't have these things that happen like the Taken King. Taken King was a good story, but it didn't actually move your character forward. It didn't actually progress the overarching story of Destiny at all, right? So that's their goal moving forward is to start progressing the story of Destiny. But because, I mean, the whole writing team was fired before Destiny 1 came out, right? So Marty even O'Donnell, if the they had an idea what the darkness was. That was a big part of it. They can't ever really find on, out what it was. Before they, all right, never mind. I lost my progress. <laughs> no, you, you were saying that the entire writing team was fired before. Yeah, so even they, if they wanted they to finish fired. the story. They... Even if they, if those guys knew what the darkness was, they might have. That pro- that knowledge is no longer part of Bungie. <laughs> it makes perfect yeah. sense. You know it what I'm saying? Makes perfect sense, bro. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah when you I think, think it's of the just whole, the whole picture that way. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's good news, um, which is why I put it in. But my uh, hot take on it is they're just playing the hand they've been dealt. You know, they've been given a hot steaming mess um, and told to clean it up for the sequel. They in my the opinion, reset. 
Destiny yeah. 2 is damage control. It's cleaning up all the mess that the first game was, you know, sanding it down, filing it, making it efficient, stripping it back to bare bones and building from the foundations. So I don't think we're going to get the perfect sequel that we wanted. No. Uh, I don't think it's going to be close to it. But I think we're going to have the right foundations to build a great game from. And, you know, I think that's the takeaway here. What I actually like about that is, as, as you know, people can say Luke Smith shouldn't be allowed to talk. Luke Smith's terrible at interviews. I, I like the candid honesty that he had because he could have put a PR spin on that saying, you know, oh, the darkness is, you know, will unfold what, what we've got planned for the darkness in the future. Instead, he was just shot from the hip and was very, very honest. And the, the well, same really with Destiny 1. So I don't know. He's not good I at him speaking it. his mind. And he seems to I just completely agree with you, Gary. Whenever he talks, so... Well, Robbie, that's because the internet is so like inflammatory. But mm -hmm. it's nice and refreshing True. to see somebody actually say something. Be honest and be honest about it. I I really enjoy Luke Smith interviews. Um, okay. I will I will admit that every once in a while, he puts things in a way that if you don't know Luke Smith and like where he's coming from, because he's kind of a sarcastic dude. He's a hyper intelligent kind of sarcastic dude. It can come across standoffish, and, it, and it, especially when. You don't hear the quote like on a podcast. You see the written version of it. Mm -hmm. You got to understand that interview that he was doing with Jason Schreer. Understand those two people, right? Jason Schreer is the guy who's been digging the dirt of Bungie for the last three years. He's the guy who broke the story about how the with the troubled development at at Bungie. He's the guy who broke the story that Destiny Two was going to de get delayed. He is the guy. He's writing a book that's coming out in September with the release of Destiny 2 about the yeah, troubled yeah. history of Bungie. Like, he is that guy, right? Luke Smith comes in to do an interview. He knows who that guy is. He's sitting across from he this guy. He's causing fucking headaches for Luke Smith for the last three years. But <laughs> Luke Smith is also the guy who used to do that job at Kotaku. He yes, literally he had the same job. So it's it's a really interesting dynamic, and you, when you listen to the interview, you can hear that play out. But when you read it in text form, it just doesn't work as well because it's a text. It's text form. Let me ask you, guys, maybe we can put it in the, in, into a more colorful scenario. Is this kind of like what happened with the original launch of the Xbox with Don Matrick and how after Phil Spencer came along, he kind of restructured it and started it anew? Is that yeah, kind of what's going on with, 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 it is with Destiny? To that. Yeah, it's like you got... You got a new management team. You got a new creative d development team, and they've been really they they started with the Taken King. That was their first big project. This team, and then after the success of the Taken King, they were asked, "Okay, do you want to be the developers of Destiny Two, and or the the creative team?" And they said, "Yes, but we want to keep this team together. We want to keep this management structure together that w w works so well in the Taken King." And they obviously built, you know, added to that. Um, but I mean, if you think about it, Destiny 2 was supposed to come out last year. It was supposed to be out for a year already. Right. And, you know, like yeah. any, any, when we heard about the development problems of Destiny, we thought it was over when the game came out, but it was cl clearly still continuing. So, you know, yeah. this is a whole new team that is now developing and they've done a great job. If you look at the content they've produced, the best stuff that Destiny has come out with has been made by these guys. Now they're 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 in charge of the whole project, and that's good. But that also this comes right. with a lot of big changes, right? From uh, one trouble developer to another, did you guys hear what <laughs> happened to Hitman IO and Square Enix? Yeah, this so is the awesome. Hitman, Hitman developer IO Interactive has gone indie, and they've just sweeped the IP into a suitcase and just taken it with them. Um, so oh, IO have, have completed a full independent studio, yeah. uh, have become a fully independent studio, agreeing to a management buyout on the condition that they retain the rights to the Hitman franchise. IO apparently had a further three seasons of content planned for the Hitman game. So we have yet to see whether that will ever come to players in the state that they planned. What do we think of that then? They've just sort of given Square Enix the finger and rolled out with their IP. I don't think that's I, that's not how I take it. I think Square had to have a hand in allowing this to happen, right? Is when they let go of IO, you know, to allow them to leave with the IP of Hitman, that's great. That's actually kind of cool. It's like obviously Square was not happy with the performance of Hitman, even though it was a lot of people's game of the year and it's a fantastic game. And to see IO leave and keep that 
keep that IP. I'm actually really excited for IO. That's that's huge news, man. This is this is an overwhelmingly good thing, and it's actually got me like really. I want to go play some more Hitman because that game is fun as shit. Oh yeah, <laughs> they need a publisher or a Kickstarter. That's what yeah. they need. Yeah, I bet they'll find a publisher. Yeah, more than likely. I mean. I mean- I've only played maybe a few hours of Hitman, Briar. I mean, I went through the whole yacht scene at the very beginning of the game, and then I went mm-hmm. straight to something else because I got so much around me. But when yacht I played scene it, is I... basically a tutorial. You got to at least go to the first real scene. It's See, so I, didn't, I didn't. Even, I didn't even make it that far. It took me like two hours to get through that. But just during that aspect of the game, I saw there are so many different things you could do. It's really like a sandbox with a ton of toys you can play with. And if the entire game is like that, it's a huge deal. I, I honestly still can't believe that Square will let that go. Not yeah. the IP, you know. So that's a real big deal for IL. If yeah. if they can get if they can get a Kickstarter, get somebody to publish the game, they'll get a publisher. There's no doubt. I mean, they have the they have the Hitman franchise. They can start working on a new game with the same same engine, you know, and just and people are ready for it. People want more Hitman because the last game was so good. It was so fun, and it was so Did it was it so fun see- to watch. It was so fun to watch other people play it because the options were just wide open. Did it not see commercial success? Is that the issue with Square? No, no not commercial success whatsoever. Wanted. The problem was it was sold as a digital only game, episodic digital Episodes, only. So yeah. there was issues there. Um, they came, and out, they came out with a like a full retail release. Box That's version, what I have. Yeah, but it was like so far after, like yeah, yeah. just didn't matter. <laughs> wow. Good so, luck. did anyone else see the eight hundred dollar Assassin's Creed Origins Collector's Edition? And I'd like to make the point here clear that it does not include any sort of sexual gratification. There's no lap dances, no handy tokens included what in the it. Eight hundred dollars. No panties like it PS comes with like a two foot tall version of like the main character, right? Like a so statue. The, there's going to be six versions of the Assassin's Creed Origin um, game, ranging from the $60 standard up to this $800 monstrosity. Yeah. As you say, Briar, the $800 one's got bespoke packaging, two handmade resin statues of characters and items from the game, and handmade lithographs signed in like blood and semen of the developers, I think. I'm not oh, quite that, sure what that's great. <laughs> done to do. Yeah. 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 Ah, you're right there. Is this a step too far? What do we think? Eight hundred dollars. I mean, I I feel like I still got two hundred dollars left over for another special edition. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, shit. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's kind well, of my house. My been... frankly, my living room is not complete until I have two two foot tall resin statues of Assassin's Creed. What's the name of the game? Origins. <laughs> yeah. Assassin's yeah. Creed <laughs> Origins <laughs> characters. I, I'm thinking what I'm going to do is have one on each uh, each side of the mantle, right? Yeah. To protect your entertainment center, yeah. I think it's going to look fantastic, and eight hundred dollars <laughs> is a small price to pay for such a fantastic piece of artwork. Plus, oh, I get the, steal. I get the yeah. the lithographs. I mean, uh-huh. signed. What do I do with a lithograph? Do I, uh, is that a poster? <laughs> say the incantations, Briar. Look, I Briar. Just in case you didn't know, Briar, you can go yeah. to a furniture shop and spend two hundred bucks and get two big resin like jaguars mm-hmm. and sit those next to your entertainment center. And they actually look like they'll protect your house. Mm. Save I don't know, man. A dude with a like a switchblade wrist knife, that dude's gonna do some protecting of my house. That's gonna kneecap your wife and kids, man. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. It's like, yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, if anyone in chat has a pre-order for that, um, please do let us know because. Obviously, you're not donating enough to Mr. Rabbit's it's, stream. It's limited too. Like, there's only going to be a thousand <laughs> copies not. of this as well. So it's not like it's you know expected to let, tons of people be buying what, this. But let me ask you guys a thousand of them. Okay. It's only a thousand of these eight hundred dollar monstrosities. <laughs> Are there well, really when you put a, it that way, yeah. Okay. Eight hundred dollars for a pre-order or a special edition of a game you haven't played yet? Isn't that kind of putting the cart before the horse a little bit? I totally agree. It's for a game you that's, haven't played. That's such an important well, thing. It's a game could, you don't know if it's, it's good. What if it's a game you buy and you... Yeah. What if it's like No Man's Sky? What if Briar and Robbie bought No Man's Sky, the $800 edition with a big-ass ship, and they brought it home and played it and were like, this game, I'm not going to play it next week. But hey, at least I got this giant ship. Yeah, it was just an okay game, you know? It's like, oh, well, at least I got my $800 worth of random stuff. Yay. <laughs> I see Brian's Woo. wheels turning. His wheels are I mean, turning right now. Yeah, Robbie it's an was going to go and buy a 1080 Ti, but instead he's made a pre-order for this uh, Origins, so he'll be enjoying that on the Xbox One. Have fun, um, 
Bethesda's executive has confirmed, Pete Hines should say at Bethesda, has confirmed that Elder Scrolls 6 is not happening anytime soon. And that is actually good news for everybody involved. Yep. There's a quote from Pete Hines who confirmed that the game will happen someday. Quite honestly, we don't want to be the developer that just has Elder Scrolls and Fallout for the rest of our careers. We have three cr kick-ass, crazy projects we're working on, and you will be blown away when you see what we've been up to. Dude, they're too busy pumping out Skyrim ports for everything that comes out. True. Yeah. You know, that was the three crazy projects. Yeah. I got an iPhone here. No Skyrim on it. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Just wait, Briar. It's coming. It's coming. Gear VR, VR port. Hello. <laughs> That's next, too. Yeah. I mean, I got an Atari 2600 flashback. No Skyrim. <laughs> yeah, when where's Skyrim on my microwave or my freaking potato or something? Who knows? I don't know. I'm waiting yeah. for that. Let me ask you guys a question real quick about that. Now, I know that they've got Fallout VR coming to Oculus, right? Fallout uh, 4 yeah, VR. Yeah, VR is coming yeah, to, no, it's and, coming to, yeah, Vive. And, and uh, PlayStation is getting Skyrim VR. Are these full games? Skyrim's yeah. also coming to Oculus, and yeah, it's, uh, sorry, to Vive, and yes, it's uh, full games. Yeah. Oh, my God. So so PlayStation is not getting uh, the Fallout 4 VR, from no. what I understand. No, oh. from what, for now, it hasn't been announced. Not yet. I don't think they can make that thing run at a high enough frame rate on a PS4. Yeah. I, I think, think that's 30 probably frames is probably going to be the, the best they could do. Yeah, you don't but want I like to the VR fact you can actually walk second. around in the game rather than teleport around. To me, that that's the, the thing that makes all the difference in those kind of games. We'll see, yeah. right? Like, I'm interested yeah. to play these. I'm not hearing great things coming out of E3, though, from them. They're <laughs> full price full again, out. though, which is ridiculous. Like, this that doesn't is another... bother me. I just want it to be an awesome experience, and that's yeah. what's bothering me is that that's not what i'm hearing i'm not hearing people say i walked out of the you know the demo for fallout vr and i was blown away i'm yeah, hearing that's true eh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. in fact yeah. doom vfr is getting like kind of better buzz than skyrim vr or fallout vr really that's odd that's yeah. odd because that game does not look fun maybe no. it's something you got to play yeah. Talking about things that you got to play, Super Mario Odyssey, local co-op. Um, I mean, have you guys seen Cappy Cappy, the the little hat? Um, I guess Nintendo have confirmed now that Cappy will be the co-op character. So if you've ever played Child of Light um, with Aurora, the, the main character, she's got a spirit companion, um, Igniculus, like a little light, blue light thing. Uh, and a second controller can control the blue light and help her out and do things. You're not actually a player character. You're kind of like a helpful mm -hmm. companion. Super Mario Odyssey will have that feature come back. So if you've got any kids that you, you're you neglecting to babysit, you can just give them a controller and they can fly a hat around the screen. So that's kind hey, of there you go. perfect. Perfect childcare. Wow. Local and online co-op. Nintendo stepping up their online infrastructure game, guys. They are. They are. Uh, Microsoft have spoken about the xbox one x uh, in response to the chatter around the 500 dollars or 499 price tag and explained the position in the value tree now i'm going to read this quote because i found it quite interesting and we can see if we agree with it or if it's just clever marketing spiel um this is mike ibarra um at uh, his xbox engineering lead who said we're all about choice starting with the xbox one s at a more uh, sorry as a more capable console at 200 dollars the Xbox One X, meanwhile, is aimed at the high-end gamer. If you want the best possible experience, there's no better place to find it for a performance-to-price ratio than the Xbox One X, delivering true 4K at 499 Further up the ladder is the PC market, where you can spend $1,500 or above. This is another area, and we love to show support in that space. Uh, there's almost 20 of our games in the show that are going to be live on Windows 2. So what I liked about this was that they showed that Xbox are trying to create, or Microsoft are trying to create a family. People are always saying, why would I buy a One X? I can get a PC. Well, you can't, you know, that, that is, and Brian, you've given that example before that, well, you know, for $700, I can get a PC. Well, Xbox agree with you and say for $700, you could, but for $500, you can get a One X. So it's kind mm. of that middle ground between the budget option and the top end PC. Uh, and I think it, it really makes it a more compelling proposition in the thing. Do you buy into that bullshit or do you this think is it's a marketing spill? This is a complete 180 from the way Microsoft launched the Xbox One. I remember, I think it was, uh, uh, not Phil Spencer, but his predecessor. Yeah, he said, if you don't have the money for an Xbox One, we have something for you. It's called the Xbox 360. It was uh, not inclusive yeah. at all. It was a really horrible thing. And, and I think that the message that they're sending out to gamers and consumers now is that we have something for everyone. 
If you have a PC, we have games you can play. If you have just enough money for the Xbox One S, it's $250. You can go buy that. If you want a mid-ranged experience, you can get the Xbox One X. It seems so inclusive, and it doesn't really offend anyone because it's something there for everybody. Right. And to me, that's a complete 180 from, from the message that Don Matrick had sent out to consumers a few years ago. Mm. Great messaging. Yeah. I, I, what do you guys think? I still have a little bit of a problem with the value proposition of the Xbox One X, especially if you already own an Xbox. But I, I can definitely understand where he's coming from with these statements. You know, it, it's it's a weird thing having a five hundred dollar console on the market. You know, that's a lot of money for a console. Yeah, and saying this is going to be the same performance as a fifteen hundred dollar PC, not well, they're quite. not saying it's the same. They're, they're but I get what he's, where he's coming from. Like it's going to be a pretty high end experience for a console, no doubt. It's definitely no going to be high end. I mean, and we take into account we bought PS4 Pros for four hundred dollars that don't have a liquid cool system that doesn't have a four K Blu Ray player installed that only has that doesn't have 12 gigs of GDDR5 RAM, it only has eight. Uh, mm -hmm. To me, the, the value is worth it for, for the, the hardware that you're actually getting out of the box. I mean, a liquid cool system, just putting that on your PC is gonna cost you a good grip of money. Oh, yeah. No, it's, and so it's to have definitely that kind good of price new, for what's in there. Yeah, and and look at the thing, it, it looks amazing to me. It looks, it's very attractive as far as a console. Mm -hmm. I still can't believe they got it as small as they did. So to me, that $500, you know, Especially for someone who's in the market for you know pick, picking up a a console for the home, I think that the Xbox One X is really attractive at this time. Unless you're looking for exclusives only, I, think I know it has I'm getting this that. place. I'm, well, that's a, I'm that's, glad it to me what they really they did at E3. That was the magic tr trick they pulled off at E3 was that they they showed enough game for over 40 games and over 20 exclusives. Um, that really kind of sold me. Like, yeah, there's some games coming out for the Xbox. Absolutely. Um, I'm down with that. You know, that's been what they've been missing for the last three years. You know, after after we got done watching E3, the Xbox and the PlayStation conferences, my son looked at me. He said, Dad, PlayStation, how, how did they let this happen? I said, Microsoft destroyed them this year, son. They completely destroyed PlayStation this year. And it would be a really boring environment if PlayStation won every E3. Microsoft went out there. And you're right, Brian. This is the first time in years they actually showed exclusives for Microsoft that to me looked on par with the exclusive we've seen for PlayStation for the last couple of years. Now they got games in the pipeline that actually piqued my interest. And I'm like, I have to play that game. So, I mean, I'm excited for the future. I think that they're, they've got great marketing. I think they got great hardware for the people who are looking for that premium experience. And unfortunately for people who do YouTube and Twitch. Right so there. talking about great exclusives that are coming to the Xbox One X, did you hear the news about Player Unknown's Battleground adding player controlled zombies? This looks mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. yeah. Fun. It does look cool. That's I'm crazy, intrigued, man. No doubt. There was a yeah. short Twitter video uh, where the developer teased hordes of the undead. So they've said Battlegrounds high stakes, slow paced combat make it the perfect place for adding hordes of zombies, which will force human players to work together to survive. The community manager um, said Battlegrounds matches contain 100 players. This mode makes total sense. I loved Halo's infection. And I imagine this will play somewhat similarly with the stakes turned up to 11. Now, Brian, you weren't that keen on zombies when you first heard it, but hearing that they're player controlled. Does yeah, that, that sounds like a lot of fun because all of a sudden you got, let's say you got a team of, I don't know, four to 10, you know, people. And then you got a team of 90 fucking zombies and they're all like them fast running, nasty like one or two, one two, one or two shot kill zombies, and you got a adrenaline fueled experience because, like, you you drop in right, and you're gonna want to drop in with your team, try and get loaded up as quick as possible. There's gonna be zombies everywhere, and it's God, gonna start yeah. off that you see one or two at a time, but as as those zombies start to group together, like you might yeah. see twenty at a time, and they're all running at you as fast as they can. And if they hit you twice, you're done. You know, like that sounds like really a lot of fun. That's cool. That's really cool. It's gonna it's gonna be way more fun to be the uh, guy with the gun than the zombie, though. That's gonna be the problem with the mode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how the mode exactly works, and if there'll be respawns for the zombies or not, and whether it's yeah, a true well, horde mode. Balanced. Or if you get infected, maybe you become a zombie. Who knows how they'll do it? Possibly. Possibly. It sounds like a um, lot of fun to me. Very cool idea. Or crossplay. Talking about um, crossplay, actually, PS4 bosses have explained why Sony don't want to play with Xbox. Did you hear what Jim Ryan said? This was a little yeah. bit insulting, actually. Um, they were talking about the 
uh, crossplay between Xbox Nintendo. and Nintendo Switch on Minecraft, uh, and have said that Sony will not be taking part. They've said that while Sony are always interested in having discussions with other companies about their options, unfortunately, it's a commercial decision between our stakeholders, and we want to protect the user base from external influences and experiences outside of the PlayStation curated universe. So it looks to me like Sony are worried about the uh, the hardcore gaming and exclusively adult demographic that Switch Talks is about, really it sounds like the most or corporate <laughs> answer you could possibly give. I have not heard something more corporate than that. It's the same deal with Rocket League as well, Gary. Uh, that's going to be cross-play between Nintendo Nintendo Switch and the Xbox One as well, and of course PlayStation backed out of that. Uh, I it that just, was PlayStation and PC, or is that is that not the case on Rocket no. League? No, it's no. it's Nintendo Switch is playing with the Xbox right. as well. So yeah, that's that's bad news, and, and we heard about this you know over a year ago that Microsoft was ready to uh, do cross play with PlayStation, and good thing for gamers is that Nintendo is actually open to the idea at least in the console space. So. But that does put, you know, kind of a, a cloud over over Sony and, and them not wanting to share their ecosystem with gamers, period. Makes them look a little salty to me. Every Another every name. potential Xbox sold or every Xbox sold or PC sold or Switch sold is a potential PlayStation not being sold. Absolutely, so the, yeah. The, the value of being in first place and allowing this to happen doesn't make a lot of sense. If Sony was in second place and Microsoft was in first place... Might be hearing a different, be, different thing out of yeah. both of these companies. Although, I'm really starting to get a good impression of Phil Spencer. Like, he really believes a lot of this stuff. It's not just mm -hmm. the second place company saying this stuff, but we'll see if the right. roles do reverse. We'll see how, how quickly positions out in these issues switch as well. Agreed. Switch. You would say that about Phil, bro. You would say that about Phil. Um, in other news, <laughs> there may be another player in the console business because yeah. Atari is back in the running boys uh, according to ceo fred chesney a new console called the this. atari box is in development from atari after 30 years out of the game no further information is given so we don't actually know if it's a current gen competitor or an emulation box similar to the mini emulation it, it, i can bet yeah no they've already they've already know. stated that it, ru it runs on current pc architecture so it doesn't sound like that's an emulator to me it sounds like it's going to be a more mo modern console that was a, a statement really? that was released last night yeah is running on on yeah, current go. PC architecture, and it, ha it has wood grain, guys. It has real wood grain on the front of the box. That's awesome. Are we sure? <laughs> Tell me that's not this is out. wood grain. Really that, surprising to me. That's 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 wow. there for the cooling, isn't it? Wood grain cooling. It's the the next big thing. <laughs> yeah, catch on fire. It smells like a camp campfire. Yeah. I mean, so it, it it looks. I mean, they show just a little ten second, you know, snippet of what the top of this console looks like. It looks really thin. Uh, and everybody's thinking, you know, everybody was initially saying it's a, a kind of an emulator of old Atari games. And I was thinking that's probably not the best idea because lots of people, many people my age would probably like to go back and play it. And I was hoping it wasn't the case until they, they made another statement that is based on current PC uh, architecture. And that means we're going to see new games, possibly maybe third parties and developers working with Atari to, you know, add another box to this conundrum of PlayStation, Nintendo and Xbox. Where do they fit in? If they do, let's say they come out with a console and it's a, it's a, comp like they're trying to compete, right? Like with the current gen consoles, where do they fit in? How do they, how do they work that angle? They're going to do better than the Ouya. Uh, I don't know. It, it all depends on what this thing has to offer, bro. I'm, and I'm guessing well, we'll find like, out. You know, what, what would you do? What would you do? Well, I wouldn't do a portable. I would do something that's close, at least, or comparable to the power of at least the PlayStation and the Xbox Vanilla. Uh, something that people can experience and play, and 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 hopefully get you know meaningful exclusives out of. If all you're going to do is you know multi-plant, so people have no no reason to buy it. It has to be a reason yeah. for people to actually go out and purchase this thing. So if they're like they say, they're now they're back in the business of, of video game hardware. They've got to have some meaningful exclusives in the pipeline that are coming to this thing. If it was. My money behind Atari, I'd completely stay out of, like say, the multi-plat and the 4K space because you don't have the guns to to flex in that gun show. You know, you don't you you're not Microsoft. They they've, they've got the most powerful anyway. console. Well, I wouldn't even do that. I'd look at creating an open source platform for indies. If it was me, that's um, what Ouya did. It was a horrible disaster. But then you've got the pedigree of Atari behind them. Um, and I mean, you could focus on things that are like online persistent multiplayers. So things that are like arena based shooters or survival games, that sort of thing that, that kind of people captivate to on early access platforms. 
So to me, it's something that doesn't have the strict certifications that something like Sony or Microsoft has that can let an indie developer get a game to market quicker. So that would be where I'd play as a budget console that has those sorts of games that you will not find multi-plats on. Or, or do you think it's possible they could be moving towards maybe the Steam box direction where you're able to download PC games and play them on this thing? If it's running no, PC architecture. quite think so, no. I think this will be an OUYA type thing. I no. completely agree with Gary. I see that. Like, I can't see this being a current gen type console or either that or it's like for classic Atari games. I don't. You'd have think to this be is... insane to to go in the same direction as the OUYA after watching the the catastrophe that was the. OUYA. If they no? have a different execution of it, it could work. Again, this is all we have to see how they plan this. Like, we have no idea what this thing is. So, I mean, it's yeah, healthy it's speculation. Wasted. It's, it's really exciting. Exciting. It's hard to find like an open spot in the marketplace, right? There's a, there's nothing glaring to me. Like Nintendo's really got like the handheld stuff locked down. Mm -hmm. The battle between PlayStation and Xbox. I mean, there's very little room in the marketplace. It would seem for a for a TV based console for a you know a box under the TV. Uh, the PC. I mean, how do you compete with PC? With a box, Steam. you know, Valve like, tried with Steam box. I don't know if that really <laughs> is open. So where is that? You know, the Ouya gave it a shot, and I know Beastly, you hate on the Ouya a lot. It, it, there were some real good ideas with the Ouya, and it was actually really exciting watching that thing get developed with the the indie support it had. Unfortunately, the execution of the thing was once you got it in your hands, the controller was fucking terrible. <laughs> That's yeah, more so what I'm talking was, about. I'm, I'm talking about any, the actual box you got in your hand. Not yeah, the, the idea actual physical product of it was disappointing, but the ideas was cool. I could definitely see something along that line. And it seems like it does open up, but even then you got the Xbox and the PlayStation eating your lunch with the indie dev devs, and now even the Wii is really opening up. Or not the Wii, the Switch. Uh, yeah. The Switch is opening more up to indie stuff. So, mm. man, it's, it's, ha it's hard to like look at that market and see an opening, you know? And I think they're just doing the the retro the emulator idea is just a horrible idea. It's just, well, they already you know, do that with the flashback. I mean, yeah, it's like a quick cash grab. I don't see the point in doing that mm -hmm. and, and doing a complete hardware refresh, making it look new and modern to play old stuff. So they've well, got to be doing one of the things we're talking about. You know, I, 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 I will option. say though, a wood grain console that <laughs> that Russell it's not, it's not you know? it's not <laughs> all, all yeah. Yeah. it's not all wood grain. It it, it has like. Ventilated shafts going back. It looks like a modern. Is, it, is that uh, what Atari the final product is going to look like, or is that like an going to have render? shafts? It, it, it looked like it looked like it. I mean, it looked really nice. And then That's when nice. they showed the wood green at the front, I said, "Holy shit, are they really doing this?" At first, I thought it was a joke, and then I realized it's not April, so we'll see what happens. Basically, saw wood and basically got wood. Um, I think it's you know ultimately the Atari box is a gamble, uh, a gamble on hardware to see which way it goes, and another gamble on hardware, which we don't know which way it's going to fall, is our roundtable for this week. And that is on virtual reality. What do we think of it? So I'm going to give us the uh, the lead off so you guys can, you know, come at me with your best guns and prepare your uh, prepare your arguments. But come at me, virtual bro. reality has been a hot topic in recent years with the development of premium enthusiast devices like Oculus Rift or HTC Vive and mass market consumer product launches like the Samsung Gear and the PlayStation VR. 2016 was poised to be the year of VR with society en masse abandoning their friends and family to spend time exploring virtual worlds and enjoying an entirely new dimension of internet pornography. Sales across <laughs> all platforms didn't ramp up at anywhere near the rate um, anticipated and only managed a fraction of the projected totals what went wrong is this an indication that vr is not a viable platform for games no matter how hard it's marketed or was 2016 simply a premature prediction with psvr spearheading mass market vr across 17 and 18 as developers start to understand the tech let's settle this debate right here right now what do we think vr has the potential to be a mainstream device i believe it does i I think it can have mass appeal. I think the biggest problem right now is the price point. It's just such a new, unproven technology that necessarily doesn't have tons of developers. It's expensive for the most part. Of course, PSVR is the main, you know, sort of the most real VR because, you know, you have things like Samsung Gear VR for... Uh, but for me, I believe VR is legit. I don't think it's sort of a temporary, you know, gimmicky thing. I do think it's here to stay. I think it'll just take another year or two of really honing that technology down and getting that price point where people can afford one. I think it's just give it time. I think it is here to stay, though. 
BC, you're muted. Yep, can't hear you. I did that on purpose. I got to. <laughs> I got to agree with you, Robbie. Um, let me just say, I think that VR is here to stay. I think it just has a very, very slow launch. Uh, yep. There are a few, a few meaningful issues with VR at this point in time. One is trying to explain to people what it is without them actually experiencing it. The person's never put on a VR headset. They can't really understand what it's like to have one on and turn around and look and actually yeah, that's feel like huge, you're in another place. Huge for I, it. Another aspect of VR that I, I think is probably more problematic is that there aren't any truly must-have gaming experiences for it right now. So if, you, if you're trying to sell a person on the idea of VR and they put you know a demo on their head and they're in this world, they're like, wow, this is amazing. What games are out for this? You can probably name off two or three that are okay type of experiences at this time. So I think more and more developers need to, I guess, master the technology, figure out how to... Uh, articulate video game worlds in a more meaningful way than they have at this point in time. And also another aspect of VR that's kind of problematic is it's convoluted. You know, it's, it's, it's not virtual reality movement, but it is, you know, kind of the Nintendo Wii type of motion controls. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people don't like that as much. Uh, you got this headset on, there's cords everywhere. And a lot of people feel like it's a lot more confusing than just grabbing a, a controller. And so I think, you know, kind of what Xbox planned on doing, uh, I guess, in the future with the Xbox uh, Xbox One X is having wireless VR for the home console space. That's actually what Xbox has stated that they're working on. That's why there's really no announcements for the HoloLens and nothing coming for the Xbox One X at this time is because they feel like having all these cords all over your house is a little, uh, I guess, junky and it's kind of irritating to a lot of gamers. And that's really what they're working on. And so to me, once these issues are kind of ironed out and people we have a, a more consumable way of explaining to people what VR actually is and how different it is compared to what, what we experience by playing on just a high definition television screen. And people are actually able to consume that information, put on a headset, play a game, and then have a bevy of games they can go out and buy that are meaningful and that they must play and they have to play it this, this particular way. Then I think VR is going to take off. But at this time, it's really a slow burn. You know, only early adopters are buying this thing. We're, we're playing it when, when meaningful games come out, and after that game comes out, we're not playing it anymore because there's nothing else that's coming out that's really good for the VR type of environment. So I think once developers get it nailed down, when the price becomes more consumer-friendly, and they figure out a way for people to play that doesn't seem as convoluted and it doesn't really jam up your living room space, I think then VR will be more, more consumer-friendly and, and it'll probably take off then. Yeah. What went wrong? in 2016 for VR, in my opinion, is that the technology is not ready. It, it, it seems close. Like it, it, yeah. In coming in with fresh eyes, it's like, it's a holy shit kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But once you actually start spending time with it, you can, you start really seeing the flaws of it. The wires have got to go. I think the headsets have got to go like these enormous headsets that hey, glasses. Yeah. It's such an eighties thing. Yeah. It's, it's, there's there's a few problems with it. First of all, you look at somebody and they look ridiculous with it, which is a turnoff, right? <laughs> you also, when you put that thing on, you're completely you really isolated from the world around you. So, you know, if you're used to playing in the living room and, you know, playing a bit of, you know, maybe you play some FIFA on the weekends, maybe you play some Destiny with your friends. You know, it's a huge difference between sitting on the couch, being able to, like, talk to your wife or your kids uh, while you're playing a game and getting into this immersive world and being completely, you know, locked out from the world around you. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a mental, it's another mental leap to go and, you know, get into VR as opposed to, I'm just going to boot up some player unknown battlegrounds for mm -hmm. 15 minutes while I wait for my wife to get dressed for dinner. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's a lot of work too, bro. You got to make sure the camera's in place and, it's yeah. also extraordinarily expensive. Even on the PlayStation, you're looking at how much is the headset? Four hundred dollars. Four hundred for the headset. Yeah. Four hundred for the headset, and I mean the minimum you can buy a PlayStation Four is two fifty. So you're looking at six fifty. Um, then I mean, you got to buy the camera, and and you've yeah, got to buy yeah those. right. You got to buy the camera and the move controllers. Yeah, so, so you're it's looking really at five hundred dollars for the PSVR. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, you're looking at $750. And if you go to the PC side, you're looking at $600 minimum for the Oculus Rift, which is a nice piece of kit. But you need like a $2,000 PC to run it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like... And, then, and then talk about expensive. That's a whole nother level for VR. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, so like all crazy. of this stuff, 
like all of this stuff has to get cheaper. And the people developing the software for it have to get way better. Like way mm-hmm. better. We are at yeah. the infancy of this stuff. Like every fucking game you play is a shooting gallery. You know, there's so few alternatives. Let me ask you guys. I, I was listening to Giant Bomb and they had a great conversation about this. Mm-hmm. How how many problems in your life in the last however old you are have you solved by shooting it? I can't think of one. No, I can't <laughs> either. How many no. how many problems in VR have you spent <laughs> solved shooting it? <laughs> like every oh. single one of them. <laughs> so it's like there's this problem where it's like it just feels like every interaction you have in VR is shooting stuff. Yeah, there's some really cool there's some really cool stuff going on in VR. Onward, I think, is a fantastic game and it continues to get developed i believe werewolves within is awesome too Brian. werewolves within uh the star trek bridge crew i can't wait to play that i really want to get i want to get the crew together to play that because i mean i'm a huge star trek guy and i can't wait to i know more about star trek than you do Brian. okay cool oh i didn't know it was uh, i didn't know it was a contest but But now you know apparently it is i guess you win (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah i mean like there's there's so many problems it's too expensive the hardware's not really finished yet the software's definitely not finished yet. There's a lot of problems. 2017 I, I gotta, isn't the year of VR. 2018, I don't think it's going to be the year of VR. Maybe, yeah. you know, as we get revised headsets and maybe as AR becomes a thing, right? As mm-hmm. so, it's going to take Gary. time. I'm going to disagree um, with all of you. Okay. So, in my oh, opinion, okay. I think VR landed in 2016 with a, an absolute splash. I don't think that commercial success is necessarily the t- determinant of VR being. A success and my view is shared by gabe newell uh, the valve president you know the guy behind the htc vibe who gabe confirmed that we're pretty comfortable if it turns out to be a complete failure to them it's not about commercial successes it's, you'd never launch vr with the view to we're going to have a vr in every single household not at the price point it is it's not about that it's about proving a technology and innovating it to drive it forward and i think they've done exactly that so talking about shooting in a game I don't play those games in VR. I don't massively enjoy shooting games in VR. The number one experience that I have in Oculus is Google Earth VR. And it has been that all the way through. And I keep going back to that. And I will put on Google Earth VR at least once a week. I Mm. shit you not. Even even now? Even now. Even now. To me, there's so many places in the world that I haven't seen and I haven't been to that I can quite happily go to in VR. I can experience it in a perspective that I couldn't if I was there. I get time to look around, I see it from different places, I see travel times between things. Just again, as someone who is um, appreciative of the world that I live in and someone who doesn't get the time to do it themselves, to me VR is an educational tool and a window that I just don't have elsewhere. I also like to play experiences like Dear Angelica that I showed you, like the visual novel kind of um, experience or visual story that I paint. I'm not into VR for what games it can give me i've got lots of other platforms to play games on if i wanted a vr system for games i'd have bought the playstation what well, i did buy it but I'd have, I'd have kept the playstation vr and used that to me vr is a an advanced technology that we as consumers have not yet figured out exactly where its niche is um but certainly i think gaming is a secondary application of vr and if you're buying vr exclusively for gaming you're missing out on a huge segment of what VR can deliver. And, and I might agree with you, but unfortunately, I own VR on a gaming console, and so that's pretty much the only would, way for I me. I wish they would bring Google Earth to the PlayStation. That's what I'm actually reading on right now. Yeah, it doesn't look like awesome. they are. Yeah. No, it's it's very, very demanding on your computer, and also the move controls for the Oculus give you the freedom to almost be Superman, you know, because I can lean forward and I can take off and fly around, I can zoom in, I can teleport to where I want to go. <sighs> to me, that's that's something that's just very liberating. Um, and also the the VR that you get on the Oculus and the Vive, uh, sorry, on the, yeah, it's the Oculus and the Vive, um, are, uh, you know, they're open platforms. There's so many little experiences, whether it's tours around museums, I experience the Titanic, things like that, educational experiences that you just can't get on the PlayStation VR. Um, the other thing that I think is holding back VR at the moment is consumer expectation of what the experience is going to be. Um, and this is that people expect the same quality that they see on a display in front of them to be emulated in VR. Mm. 
you, that's you, coming going, like all this stuff is coming gary right it's like we're gonna start seeing games that are yeah. full experiences we saw resident evil 7 well, and it was a stupendous experience in vr we're gonna mm -hmm. get higher quality displays that weigh less in our wireless you know we're, we're gonna get better controls we're gonna we're gonna get developers who better understand how to move a player around in VR without motion sickness. All that stuff's going to come. I, I, I see what you're saying about the, the VR experiences, but I don't really agree with you because they're all... Google Earth is pretty spectacular, but like I got sick of it really quick. Like It was like, okay, that was the... Uh, when I get down to street level, it's like this blocky mess that doesn't really represent what's actually down there and it the mm -hmm. illusion falls apart a little bit once you get down to ground level um going like and checking out the titanic in vr is pretty cool once but it's not something that is going to justify the outlay of these like 800 dollars headsets right so it's it, like i see what you're saying about that but to me i want to i want video games that's you know that's what i'm about that's the experience that i want out of vr because mm -hmm. it's something that i've been thinking about and wishing for since the 90s and it's not there yet, but it's going to get there. We just got to Let me wait. ask you a question. Let me ask you a question, bro. Mm -hmm. You said that the technology isn't there yet. Are you including the HTC Vive and the Oculus? Yeah. Uh, both of those? Okay, so yeah. PSVR yeah. is way behind. But those you mentioned two. as well that, that you want to play games and that these, these I systems... I want to add something into it when okay. I can. Okay. I was going to say, I kind of agree with Briar, you and Gary, both on some points. I agree with Briar that... VR is going to be great for gaming. That's a cool expectation. Gary, I think, honestly, for me, though, I think there are even more exciting things to me than just gaming on VR. Like, VR is so much more than just video games. I think it's practical. I think it's good for education. I think there's a lot of amazing applications for it. Like, I think this is so much more open than that. And I think that's also partially why we haven't necessarily seen VR go mainstream is because I think it can be used for so many more things than just entertainment. I think it really is just such an open thing that can be utilized in a lot of amazing ways. Putting someone in an experience is just enhancing it. So you yeah. set up my, my point quite well there, Robbie. That was that was well rehearsed. It's almost hey. like we're, we're an efficient hey. team. Yeah, um, it's almost like opinion. I knew. Thanks for the handoff, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> totally intentional, yeah. <laughs> So from my perspective, you saying that, hey, I, I, I sit back, I kick it with a controller and I don't want to play, you know, putting a headset on, etc. The PlayStation VR is the easiest thing in the world to put on. You just stretch the headset straight on, you're in there. I actually had that experience at Christmas time last year. I took my PlayStation VR to a relative's house and we passed it around, you know, like like a, like a doobie, you know. We were just like, oh, have a go on the, uh, the PlayStation, have a go on it. And these are like 60-year-old relatives that have not played a game in their life. Mm. And they were in there experiencing it, playing things that they, and they were in, you know, they were playing the London heist because it was the demo disc that they were so there. one of the best demos in VR. I love yeah, it. That's yeah. cool. So yeah. they were able to, to, to use the controls and understand how to reload a gun and things like that, that they just couldn't ever fathom with a controller. So you, in the same way that the Wii was immediately playable to people, I think you discounting the casual market and saying, well, as a gamer, what is there for me? I think you're missing that, you know, mobile gaming, for example, wouldn't necessarily appeal to a lot of us, but it's one of the yeah. largest demographics on the market because the value proposition's there. Yeah, but you asked me the question. You asked us the question, right? So you're going to get our opinion. We're going to get, you're going to get what do we want out of VR and what do we see the problem with VR is mm -hmm. trying to, trying to sell a $800 headset to people who their main interaction with video games is on their cell phone by a, playing mobile games that's not gonna fucking work yeah it's not gonna work at all <laughs> the cost is the prohibitive factor there i think the issue being is that for it to be a mass market proposition obviously the cost needs to reduce to allow it but from my perspective is at the moment no one's the media and the analysts are the people that said that it has to be a mass market proposition they're the people that dubbed 2016 the year of VR. also the people and who no want to sell software need it to be mass market you're never going to get you're never going to get huge you know epic pieces of software if you know the PlayStation is the only VR headset that's broken a million sales, you know? Yeah. And you're never going to get, like, these amazing pieces of software, you know, that blow your mind with their production values if the, the, if the headsets aren't selling, if there's, if there's no place to sell these things to. So it's got to. Like, if you want VR to truly, like, reach its potential, it's got to hit some kind of mainstream success. Right. And that, that's, that's critical apps. They need critical applications that are must-plays. But it's, it's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You can't 
you can't make the great software unless you sell the headsets, and you can't sell the headsets unless you have the great piece of software. That's why when we heard Oculus was shutting down their studios, that was really disappointing news. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, I guess to to wrap up the um the convo, in my perspective as well, probably very flippantly and uh, and cynically, I think it hasn't helped that VR media. Um, whether it's movies, whether it's adult movies, haven't necessarily got behind VR in the way that, that we expected them to. So it's well documented that, you know, the porn industry sold VHS and DVD. They were the guys mm -hmm. that pushed the mm -hmm. tech and got behind it and went there. We haven't seen that happen in the VR space, possibly because there's not the uh, the hardware there, but also because the displays aren't there. Like So Briar and I have got the PC VRs. If you watch a video, so I know, uh, BC, you've tried to watch videos on the PlayStation, like the zombie videos and things like that that came in the game. They're shitty videos. as hell. They're not much better on the PC version. So the problem is that yeah. media consumption, it just it, you can't really look at it and be, there's no disbelief that you're actually watching that in reality, even so for, you know. 4K there, video doesn't look good. There's a really cool app on. I don't, I don't know if it's for Oculus or for Steam VR, but it's a it's a Hulu app where you sit in this kind of lounge and have this gigantic screen in front of you. Yeah. And you can just watch Hulu, right? You, you use your Hulu account. It's a fucking cool ass experience, but the whole time you're sitting there, you're thinking, "This would look better on my TV." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, but once these things are like 4K displays, maybe even higher, that. That could change. Once these things are like retinal level displays, that could change. And then all of a sudden, you know, the best place for me to go watch a Hulu show could be in this like personal giant ass movie theater. I don't have to have a, a 75 inch screen in my living room because I got like a, you know, a 200 inch screen in VR. So there's some cool experiences that are can be had there. All they gotta do, Briar, is make it so that everybody can can log into the same account, or you can have guests to log in with you, and you can look around the theater and see your friends there eating Fuck popcorn. That. With you know you. who I hate the most in this world? People who? who talk during movies. They deserve to be shot. Every <laughs> one of them, dead as a doornail. If you even a utter movie. a cough during a movie, <laughs> look at his You face. should be brained with a mallet. <laughs> <laughs> Briar, wow. That's hard. Uh, the last thing Briar I want to do no is patience. introduce other people to my movie watching experience so they can distract me from it. <laughs> I get to watch like one movie a month. <laughs> and yeah. the last thing I want to hear is your fucking comments about it. <laughs> it's about to happen now, Briar. Watch. <laughs> So oh, wow. we haven't settled uh, whether 2016 was or wasn't the era of VR, but we sure as hell know that you do not talk in a movie theater in Connecticut. <laughs> yeah, Brian's Nowhere. got no patience for that. That's it. That's Shit. the takeaway from here. Fuck I'll smack you down. Yeah. You guys yeah. let us know. Look at his comments. eyes. <laughs> you, guys, you guys let us know in the comments what you think about today's uh, roundtable topic. Uh, PlayStation VR, Oculus Rift, HTC Vive. Was 2016 the year of VR? Do you guys think it's a, bur a bubble that isn't going to burst. I don't think I just, do any of us really think it's a bubble. I I mean, you think it's a bubble, Gary? I do. Yeah. I think that there's going to be VR is going to continue behind the scenes and the people that are enthusiasts and the people that enjoy it are going to continue using it in the same way that I do. And I think there's going to be development for it. Um, in the same way that E3 had a kind of a muted VR presence. Yeah. I think that the media are going to get bored of keep pushing this VR story because you know, it's, it's not taken off in the way it is. And I think VR is going to go back underground uh, and I think that VR may pop its head up again when we get the Oculus Rift CV2, you know, the new consumer variant and maybe whatever the, the Vive replacement is. If there's a 4K display, then there'll be a bit of buzz. But yeah, at the moment, I think that we're going to have a very, very quiet 2017-18 um, with uh, a limited release of games. I mean, what, there's five, six AAA games coming out this year, maybe, maybe less. And they're all remakes. So. Yeah. yeah. Have you? And when's the last time you played your VR, Briar? I know you were playing it on PC for a while, a few months ago. Yeah. Have you been into it recently? No. Uh, I jumped into Onward like a month ago, <laughs> but to be honest with you, the my problem isn't the VR itself. It's that PUBG just has me by the gonads right now. <laughs> like, when I sit down to play yeah. a video game, I just want to play PUBG. I want to jump in and get with the murder. Like that's and right. that's how I am. I'm obsessive with that kind of stuff. When I was playing Steam or when I was playing. Uh, VR. I was playing Onward, and I was playing a lot of it, and I was really enjoying it. Um, but I'd like to get back in Onward. I'd love it. Man, how cool would PUBG be in VR? Oh, my God. As it is, oh. when I hear an unexpe unexpected gunshot, I'm like, huh! 
<laughs> VR. Yeah. Oh my god. You'd feel it like whiz past your head too if there was someone oh, shooting yeah. you. Oh, dude, if you dude. could hear the bullets like really whiz past your head, you could bring up your gun and you could look. You're like, oh Whoa, look man, VR. I want PUBG in VR now. <laughs> <laughs> we sold there you already. Go. Sold. Yeah. Running around jumping and jumping up. in a buggy and driving that buggy around or jumping that on a motorcycle. Crazy, man. Oh man, that would be crazy as hell. That'd be awesome. Maybe it'll come. Who knows? Better hit Should that Twitter up to there. Some uh, some Twitter questions and see. Yeah, what the, let's uh... hear some Twitter questions. So this is our first for uh, the Beastly Thoughts live show, and I think it's it gonna is. be a lot of fun. It is. Uh, so we'll be doing this. We'll be uh, tweeting out on Sundays. If you'd like to ask us a question, just respond to that tweet. Um, and let's do it. Robbie, are you going to read the questions for us? Yeah, let's get it started, guys. All right, first question of the week comes from Josh G on Twitter, and his question is, which game have you always wanted to play but haven't yet, and why not? Hmm. This is Good a deep question. one. So I guess I can kick off. For me, a game that I've always wanted to play, and it's not a, a big one, but it's one that I've seen around. It's a series, actually, two games. Mm -hmm. and it's a game called Company of Heroes. Uh, and this resurged again mm, yeah. when I saw the Call of Duty World War II trailer because I saw the trailer for Company Heroes, which starts off with some guys doing the, um, the the landing at Omaha. And I think the entire squad gets mowed down and killed. And then the game pans out into the RTS mode and you're controlling like, the whole battlefield. Um, yeah, I've got it on Steam. I bought it immediately after seeing that trailer and never played it. But it, it's not a case of... You know anything stopping me time wise it's just i am an rts noob and i'm scared to get owned so same. i will play it. <laughs> same, same. i appreciate the honesty for me game. it's it's world of warcraft and I, i'm cheating a little bit because i did mm. play a few hours of it like way 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 back and the reason i want to play it because it seems so awesome is you, you know explore this awesome world with your friends and find all this loot and do all these raids and these dungeons and there's just so much to do and to explore but what keeps me away is that I have a addictive personality, and I know this is a very no, bad thing life. for me. <laughs> yeah. For me yeah. to get, I'm a guy who put in over twenty five hundred dollars to like MMO light in Destiny. You give me a real MMO, bad shit it's could over. happen in my lifetime. <laughs> I've got over yeah. ten thousand hours on World of Warcraft myself. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, yeah. ten thousand. Casey's an awful no. lot too. Our friend from uh, DCP. You being yeah. serious, Gary? Yeah, I've got over 10,000 hours in World of Warcraft. I play World of Warcraft, Anarchy Online, Dark Age of Camelot, um, Warhammer Online, Age of Rack. I played every MMO. I didn't. Destiny was the first console game I played since the Genesis. I was PC gamer all the way through. My God, that's inc in insane. Well, the game that I've always wanted to play, I haven't had the time to play. You guys probably already know what it is. It's Final Fantasy XV because I mm. am such a huge Final Fantasy fan. I do a legend Final, Final Fantasy, Fantasy fan. fan. Yeah, well, we're <laughs> going to question that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I genuinely am. I love Final Fantasy. I've loved all the games. Uh, I didn't like Final Fantasy 13 as much. It, it kind of veered away from what I was, you know, used to in my teen years. But I did play the demos for Final Fantasy 15. I love the open world aspect, the way the game looks, the way it feels when you play. It's just really amazing. And and I have other games. Like, you know, I still haven't played Nier Automata. I haven't tried to even got started in that game. Uh this is what happens for me. And it's not that I don't want to play it. I do want to play it, but I do know something else as well. Once I get started on a game like that, RPGs take a lot of commitment. It takes a lot of time. And you don't want to just play it over the course of weeks because it's it at that time you stretch it out to the point where you forget what you did weeks ago. You start to forget, you know, yeah. the places you've been. And for me, you know, in my younger years, I'd go through an RPG in one week. And now with kids, full time employment, a YouTube channel, that time is so dwindling. I'll look at you know Final Fantasy 15, and I'll look at something like Friday the 13th or Tekken 7, which I'm playing now, and I'll say I could play one or two matches of you know Tekken, yeah. and I could go do what I need to do with the kids, or you know handle business around the house, or go to this place. But if I play Final Fantasy 15, it's going to eat up so much of my time. It's going to slow me down from life. It's going to slow me down from other things I need to do. So what I really need to do, honestly, to play it is wait till my vacation time, which will be next month, yeah. and 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 play it then. And that's honestly the the true reason why I haven't played it. I really wanted to. My wife actually started playing it. She really liked it. But I know that once I start, everything else is going to stop. And I know my personality is kind of similar to Briar's. We have a lot in common that I, I overdo things and I'll commit and, I'll, and everything else will slow down and, and everything else will matter a little bit less 
because I'll be so invested in the story and trying to loot and trying to find everything I could find. And it's just a little harder for me to do that rather than take five or ten minutes to play a match here and there in a different game. Even games like PUBG, right. which right, I suck right. at. Let's, let's move on to the next question. We should keep getting into <laughs> more questions. We got a lot of questions to get through. <laughs> and I'll quickly say for the games I've always wanted to play, Resident Evil 4 I've always wanted to try, and uh, Final Fantasy 14. You've never Rumble played Resident Born. Evil 4? Yeah, you call no. yourself an adult Probably. gamer? I haven't. I know. I really Leave. want to try it, though. I always have. Get out. That's the Resident Evil you should have okay, fucking bye. played first. I'm just leaving. I know. Right, I know. What's the next I, question? I really want to play it. Okay. All right. Next question from Enrique has said, even though Xbox One X is the most powerful system, why are third-party games still leaning towards PS4? For example, FIFA 18, Battlefront 2, and Destiny 2. It's installed base. You can sell installed more base, if you make million. it a PlayStation game. So yeah. going to target... I don't even think it's that. I think it's a marketing deal. I think it's simple. It's just Sony owns the rights to those games. They have a marketing deal. I think it's just that simple. Well, it's not about too, that's power. What it is for sure. It's all yeah, about the money. It that's really not the is. That's deal with FIFA though. And and yeah. it's there's 60 million PS4 sold through, man. If you're a developer, what are you going to do? Uh, you know, put your games on a console that's not released and and market it for that or go Bottom with the 60 line, million it's a business. That They're going to go where the money is. That's why. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Next question comes from MCU Pluson One, and he says, "Not counting Destiny Two, what games are you the most hyped for that's coming out by the end of this year?" So for me, it's a remake, um, and this is just from pure curiosity more than anything else, and that is Fallout Four VR. I'm mm. interested to see what that game plays like because I've heard. Not so great things, but also everything I've seen for it makes me interested in playing it through. So, yeah, Fallout yeah. 4 VR for nice. me. For me, I think Wolfenstein 2, because I absolutely love the first one. Uh, Super Mario Odyssey looks amazing. Destiny 2, obviously, is a big one. And I'd say Call of Duty World War 2. I'm very impressed by what they've shown from the multiplayer of that game. So that be it's my Wolfenstein for me. That trailer was perfect. I really enjoyed the first game. Uh, I'd, I'd like to be more excited for WW2, and I am excited for WW2, but, I mean, it's another COD game. Yeah. I don't know if this game is coming out this year, but the game that has me the most excited right now is Days Gone for PlayStation. And that's a 2018 and release. It is coming. Pass, right? 18. It's, yeah, it's 2018. We're pretty sure on that one. Yeah. Yeah. That game looks really incredible to me. I, I feel like they've taken a page from Naughty Dog. It feels like that kind of gritty, really heavy world, and every time I see it, I want to play it more and more. That's, that's what's so really you didn't answer the sense. question, though, Beastly. What game for 2017? Is God of War coming out this year? No. <laughs> I don't know the release. Uh, no, game. early 2018. All right, on to the next question. This comes from Chris hey, Jacobs. Just will answer. Pass. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> this question comes from Chris Jacobs on Twitter, and he says, With Destiny 2 looking more and more like an evolution than a revolution, do Destiny fans need to temper their expectations for the sequel? I think so. So we addressed this earlier. Mm -hmm. I'm going to reiterate the point. I think Destiny 2 is almost like, you know, Destiny 1 undergoing significant plastic surgery. So this is like, you know, correcting all the, the, the terrible overeating that's happened over the years and, you know, the wrinkles and the sagging that we see and putting it on the, the, the path to success, you know, like, like, um, What's it called? America's Biggest Loser. You know, this is this is like a the victory of America's Biggest Loser at the end of it. This is going to be a lean fighting machine at the end of it. Interesting ready comparison to, there. Huh. Ready to start the game. So for me, yeah. I think expect the best version of Destiny and something that is going to accelerate off the blocks as opposed to something that is always doomed to be slow and sluggish um, and, and, and not iterate on itself in the way that fans want. Yeah, and I do still think that Destiny 2 is a full sequel. I do feel confident in that. I know, yeah, a lot of people are like, this is Destiny 1.5. It doesn't seem like they've changed anything. I kind of disagree on that. This game does seem like it's enough of a sequel to me. And I think tempering expectations is never a bad idea. You know, if you've played Destiny 1, you love that game, you'll get an evolution. That's what this game will be. I think. Always well, well, temper for your expectations for every, every game. You know, when you if you're a huge Destiny fan, it's so easy to, you know, kind of buy into your own wild theories of what should be in Destiny. I would w look and see what they are actually saying about Destiny. You know, temper your expectations to what they're actually saying. Uh, look forward to the beta because that'll answer a lot of people's questions. Once you get your hands on the game, Destiny 2, 
You know, it mm-hmm. is a different game. It feels different, and it feels great. Um, but yeah, t- temper your expectations for sure. Well, agree. I'd agree. Completely. As somebody who who played a lot less Destiny than the other hosts here, uh, just hearing you know, you know the the recent news uh, about Destiny Two, the changes are being made, the things that are basically going to disappear from from the franchise. Uh, I think it's kind of a refresh, and so any pre-existing notions of what you think should exist or things that should happen in, in the universe, you got to pull it back and let them kind of rewrite history and do what they need to do. So yeah, definitely. It's temper a rough expectations. news week, right? It's a rough news week for Destiny Two fans. People are really looking forward, but look at yeah. if you look at PVE, they are still just announcing brand new stuff for PVE that we had no idea about. So, yeah. like, I mean, it's exciting. It's very exciting when you. Yeah. When I played Homecoming, the first mission, and when I played that new strike, like this is this is next level destiny stuff here. Like it is really fun. PvP guys, I think, are a little upset. Lore guys are a little upset, but the people who have played Destiny 2 at this point, they're talking positively about the game, right? Like look at the people right. who have played it and what they're saying. A lot of the a lot of the periphery of the stuff is a lot of negativity, but they haven't played the game yet. Mm. Agreed. All right, on to the next question. This one comes from Ringo the Gun, and he says, how long do you think the PS4 Pro will last against the Xbox One X? What hardware specs can Sony announce to get the momentum back again? <laughs> they haven't mm. lost any momentum, man. Uh, PlayStation, I think, is in a really good position right now. Um, the, the, the console is selling very well. One in every five PlayStation 4 sold as a pro. Uh, it, it does do faux 4K, and a lot of people who have 4K TVs are really enjoying what it's capable of doing. I don't think that the Scorpio is going to necessarily change the way that the PlayStation is approaching you know, the, their, their consumers. If anything, PlayStation is probably going to dictate what happens with the Xbox One X because most developers are developing for the console that already has an install base. So... To me, I think Sony just needs to continue to focus on games. And uh, whenever they decide to announce the PS5, I think it'll be an adequate time. But right now, I think they need to just continue to focus on games and do what they do best. Yeah, completely agree with you there, Beastly. I think they need to just stick to their strong suit, which is especially their first-party lineup looks amazing. And I think they should just take their time with PS5. I don't think there's any reason to rush that thing and say, we're here now, we're the most powerful console. I don't think they need to do that. I think they should just wait and see. It's Scorpio. Sony, so Xbox Sony can Connect. just say PS5's come in 2021 like they do with a, every game that they announce, so it's, it's fine. They <laughs> yeah. can just... Right. They don't, they don't have to say, they'll just say, now. PS5 is coming! Someday. It's going to be awesome! Someday. And then Go buy next it. year we'll hear, we PS5 promise. is coming! Yeah. And then yeah. the year after, <laughs> ps 5 still coming. Yeah. I mean, in a more serious response to it, I do think that Sony is starting to lose customer sentiment. Uh, I think Microsoft, Phil Spencer's hitting all the right notes. I think people are starting to buy into what Microsoft is selling. I think people like an underdog. They like an underdog story. Rocky Balboa was an American hero for a reason. I think that we're going to start seeing the worm turning. Um, I think PS Pro and Sony should be concerned about the latter half of this generation. And I think 2017-18 will uh, will show that. Well, probably more 2018. That's that's exciting to hear. I mean, that's good for everybody, though. What do you think, Brian? I would agree with Gary. I think that PlayStation, the brand, is losing a little bit of the momentum. I don't know if that's going to carry through to sales. I mean, they still have a very strong first-party lineup. They still have more interesting and more plentiful exclusives, in my opinion. Uh, but, you know, Xbox is putting out a, compar- a compelling narrative out there. You know, it, it, it for me, it is starting to swing that other way. Like, and... When I have an Xbox One, I'm going to want to buy third-party titles on the Xbox One, right? Like, that's just where I'm going to want to play them because it's going to look better. So, mm. you know, I, I do think, you know, I, th- I bet that next year we'll start hearing PS5 rumors. Yeah, I think you're right on that. All right, on to the next question. At Matt Grundy 89 asks, I would like to get a good 4K gaming TV or monitor for the Xbox One X. Hopefully, thirty-two inches. When should I get one, and what kind do you recommend? Uh, I would think you want to wait right now uh, because you want to you want to get you want to get sixty frames per second in HDR. And I don't HDR is think a big one. There's yeah. much out there for HDR yet, but it's like right on the horizon. 
And if they are out there, I think they cost like thirteen hundred dollars. Yeah, so especially if you're going for a monitor. There so, aren't really any 4K HDR monitors on the market yet, so I think Briar's totally right. Wait and see because they're just hitting the market, most of them. I have a 4K uh, uh, HDR TV, my LG. I'm trying to remember the exact model number, but it definitely is 4K HDR, and it's amazing. And it cost me 1300 bucks. I told you guys when I bought it. Yeah, pretty good. It's a great TV. It has HDR game mode as well, so... Yeah. I, mean, I, I have form that I have 10 minutes research. to finish this show, so we need to wrap it up. <laughs> okay, wrap we'll speed through up. questions. We need to go through it. Speed, yeah. Uh, I agree with everything the guy said. Um, wait. Yeah, wait. All right. Robbie? Robbie? Snap, All right. Snap. At Mail Weezy said on Twitter, what is the real reason Sony won't play nice on cross-play thing with Xbox and Nintendo? Your thoughts? They have no financial it- incentive to do so. They're winning. That's perfect answer, Briar. Yeah, absolutely. Think, it's about money. I think that they have Phil nudes too, or maybe maybe they slept with Phil and Phil never called them either. So <laughs> Phil I think that this is a Phil's pattern been... of philandering from <laughs> Phil Spencer. Sorry, what? <laughs> the butt stuff knows no limits with Phil Spencer. That's it. Butt stuff. Hashtag butt stuff. All right, Robbie. What we got next? All right. Evan, Ma- or sorry, at Smiley1026 says, with E3 behind us, was there any games that were not shown on stage that you were planning to pick up? Mine yeah, or Metroid Yakuza 2D, 6, man. You know, Metroid 22. 2D, they didn't show that on stage? What? That's big. Yeah. Yeah. i got to admit, Nino Kuni 2, I thought was going to be all over the Sony Bless stage. You. Really disappointed not to see. What the? <laughs> Did you see that? Haunted <laughs> that <was> House. <laughs> yeah. Did you see that? Class, man. Almost that like on that. cue, it's just like poof, fall out. There you go. The the place is literally falling apart. We are, <laughs> we got like a, a heat wave in the UK. It's like thirty four degrees, and the glue oh, has gosh. melted, melted wow. from that adhesive. Um, that's <laughs> Actually, amazing. I'm actually a Nino Kuni fan as well, and I'm surprised they didn't show that PlayStation uh, conference. That would be a huge game they didn't show. So I'll I'll agree with you there, Gary. That's a great. I share your sentiment. What you got, Robbie? Uh, for me personally, I'm surprised to say this. I don't know if you guys have seen the gameplay, but Act 2, surprisingly, it looks pretty oh, yeah, fun. I'm look, not kidding. It actually it looks look like good. a good time. Stuff. It does. I was good. genuinely surprised by that game. All right. Next up, uh, Cosmic Owl asks, what are your thoughts on Mixer? Microsoft announced several games that will have Mixer integration, like that survival game, The Darwin Project. Uh, I mean, it's a Twitch competitor. I don't really know too much about it, but apparently you got free games for watching uh, E3 on it, so there's that. I like it. I really like it, and I said that before when we covered Mixer. For me, I think it is a new ecosystem that's encouraging new streamers to get involved, especially streamers that are streaming from Xbox and viewers that are watching from Xbox. It creates a a solid competition to Twitch. I Mm -hmm. actually thought this was... To which we're going to laugh this off or completely ignore it. But the fact um, Twitch baited them uh, a little. So I don't know if you saw um, yeah, the, the Twitter image. <laughs> yeah, the kappa that they put up on the mixer. Oh, thing. yeah. The, the that fact that awesome. Twitch actually acknowledged them to me lends to some like, lends to the legitimacy of the brand. You know, the fact that it was acknowledged there shows that there was at least some some nod to them there. So I think more to come on it. Yeah, I, I, I think mixer could be a good place for growing streamers. I've actually heard it's very good. Like, I like the technology the that they're they're putting out there. And I think that's awesome. I think that the fact that they have Xbox integration is very strong for their brand. Let's see if uh, Microsoft sticks with this thing. Let's see if it's still around in two years, or if it's another Zoom or another Connect or another you know one of the well, many projects that Microsoft has done and then just dropped. I think ultimately it'll be great for for people using uh, the Xbox to do streaming. Uh, PlayStation kind of opened up the whole door with being able to capture your video and upload it directly to YouTube. And that's actually spawned tons of YouTubers who actually now do it directly through their PlayStation. So this could have the Xbox, same effect. You can do that on Xbox too. Yeah, well, I'm, I've watched The Last of Us gameplays a lot on YouTube. And that's really what I've noticed. <laughs> tons of people who become YouTubers straight through their PlayStation. And I think having Mixer on your Xbox is a great idea for people who will inevitably become streamers. Now, since we got to leave, uh, I think it'd be best to hold these questions until next week's show. Uh, because Briar has to go uh, rescue a cat from a tree in the backyard, and we don't I, want to I'm stop getting, it. I'm getting told in no uncertain terms that I'm about to miss my father's day dinner. <laughs> Ooh, All right, so should we do one more impressive. question? Maybe just one more. All right, one more. Do the okay. last one from uh, James. Uh, let's go with Narcus's question, actually. The very, says, the very, what the game were last... you most hyped over and then the most disappointed when you actually played it? For me, Evolve. I was excited for that. 
I hate that game. I just don't like it. What about Destiny you guys? Destiny 2, Kappa. <laughs> yeah, hmm. it's not even out yet. Hmm. What it's do you guys think? Division for me. Mm. Yeah, that's a good one too. Hmm. I'd, I'd probably have to... Robbie, you guys are taking all my shit. I think that uh, Evolve was actually a pretty pretty pathetic game after we, we got in and got into it as well. I can't think of anything yeah. else right now. But I know I have a ton of games that I don't like anymore. Evolve's but the yeah, one that stands e- out. Evolve me. fell off very, very fast. We'll that was a shitty one... fucking game. <laughs> I don't like it either. I agree. I didn't I don't think it's fun. Like I just don't find it fun. This is this is a fun question and we'll do it real quick. The Beastly Thoughts if the Beastly Thoughts crew were to form a boy band, what would the group name be? And uh, what would our debut album be called? Uh, the Beastly Boys. <laughs> no. Beastly Boys. Yeah, it's got to be. Uh, no, the album. The album would be called Bestiality. And and, and <laughs> yes. the group. The group would be called Animality. Whoa. See, I'm gonna go with Gambar. <laughs> with our lead album is gonna be called uh, Girl. I want to take you to the game bar because <laughs> I just. <laughs> I think that, that sums us up quite well. Hey. All right. All right. Thank let's you wrap guys. This one up, guys. Thank you guys for joining us today for another episode of BC Thoughts Live. We go live every Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern at www.twitch.tv forward slash Briar Rabbit. The show is also uploaded to YouTube at Briar's channel and the Beastly Gamer channel. If you can't watch the live event or the video format, you are free to listen to the show in podcast form on, your, on Podbean, iTunes, or your favorite podcast service. Viewer questions can be submitted through Briar's Twitter page on Sunday before the show. And he'll ask you guys that, so be uh, ready for for that question. Thank you guys again for hanging with the crew. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place. Take care. See you next week. Bye, guys. Bye. And good. Out. You better go to.